Yeah, it's been really nice to be here. Thanks to the organizers for putting together a wonderful workshop. I've been really enjoying it. And uh, I'm going to talk to you today about two papers, mainly about the motivations and the results from two papers over the last year with Philip Schuster and our student Kevin Zhou, looking at how continuous spin particles interact with matter particles, both the classical and quantum level. And what I'm really hoping to do with this talk is to convince you that there is an interesting possibility for massless interactions beyond the holicity amplitudes that we usually talk about, and that there's, there's a lot to be gained by exploring it. Um, so to that end, I am going to huh? click, on the click on the screen. Now that it was hmm. Oh, sorry. Click on that's sometimes, but, sometimes oh, it gets okay. it gets stuck. Okay, great. So uh, so I want to start with a very simple question. When we write down holicity amplitudes, why is it that we in fact characterize the external legs of a massless amplitude by Lorentz invariant holicities. And this seems like it should have some very deep principled answer. But in fact, um, I'd argue that the reason is the one that young children and inquisitive physicists alike absolutely detest, because we the elders said so. Um, and what I mean by that is that, well, of course, you can look at the holicity operator. It's just the rotation about the three momentum direction of motion. And as I've written this, it looks like the least Lorentz invariant thing you could possibly write down for the operator. Somehow, nonetheless, magically, the eigenvalues are, are Lorentz invariant. So I want to actually explore what's going on here. And the reason this doesn't look Lorentz invariant is that it's actually part of a covariant four vector, the Polylebansky vector. And the three independent components of this four vector all generate the little group for any particle type, massive or massless. They all leave the momentum invariant. There's three components because this is orthogonal to the four momentum. One of them is proportional to helicity. The other two are proportional to linear combinations of a transverse boost and a compensating rotation that brings you back to the original momentum. So these two, which I'll call W1 and W2, they commute with one another. That means the group structure of the little group for a massless particle is ISO2. And these two have the interpretation of the translation isometries of a two-dimensional plane. Um, and they have the same commutation relation as translations with rotation. So rotation mixes one translation generator into the other. So those are the generators of the massless little group. What are the invariants? We can still look for helicity in here. And again, we fail. Because the natural Lorentz invariant quantity is the square of the poly Lebansky vector, which is actually independent of the holicity term. It cancels out, and all you're left with is something that depends on the actions of the two translations and is ne some negative definite continuous variable. So that motivates us to introduce an invariant spin scale with units of momentum such that this invariant w squared is equal to minus rho squared, where rho is this, this new spin scale characteristic of a given massless particle. So from a basic level, if you stress, just ask how do massless particles want to transform kinematically, they want to transform under this three generator little group with a dimensionful invariant, the particle spin scale. Now, what do the representations look like? Um, well, it'll be convenient, at least to get physics out, to work with holicity eigenstates. We are free to diagonalize the holicity operator. It is part of the little group, so let's do that. Let's label our states by their helicities. And their helicity eigenvalues will always be integer or half integer. For usual reasons, it just has to do with doubly connectedness of the Lorentz group. It's very tempting to think this word continuous spin must refer to some irrational number helicities. That's not what it means at all. Helicities are integers or half integers. But we have to look at these other two generators that we usually forget about. And it's convenient to group them into a complex linear combinations, w plus and w minus, and just like the massive transverse spin generators, these raise and lower the eigenvalue of the, of the helicity. And the coefficient of this raising and lowering operator has to be rho in, in order to get the right invariant. So what you find is that any integer helicity eigenstate can mix into any other linear helicity eigenstate by successively acting on it with these raising and lowering operators. That means that the generic irreducible representation of the massless little group has an infinite ladder of helicity states that all mix with each other under Lorentz transformations. And this possibility is called the bosonic continuous spin 
representation or continuous spin particles, I'll also call them CSPs. There's also a fermionic counterpart with all of the half integer spins, but I'm not going to talk about that today. There's one exception to this general rule of non Lorentz invariant helicity, which is that we can choose rho equals zero for our invariant. And in that case, w plus and minus annihilate the helicity state rather than mixing it into higher or lower helicities. So in that case, we finally get our singlet representations with a Lorentz invariant helicity, and only CPT mixes helicity plus h with minus h. So that is the choice that gives you Lorentz invariant helicity. And we've always assumed that, because that's the only thing we know how to do. And that's the only thing that we've needed to do so far in order to describe nature. Um, but it's not really clear whether this is a deep assumption that we needed to make in order to get consistent theories, or to uh, appropriate David Nuremberg's wording from yesterday, whether we've confused local custom of the community with a physical law. And so that is the question that I think we need to explore. Um, I want to just briefly tie this into another question, which is the spinner helicity formalism. Um, because one of the questions I always get is, well, how, how do we describe this in spinner helicity? And when I first learned spinner helicity, I was taught the gospel that symmetry, spinner helicity's job, reason for existing, is to encode little group covariance amplitudes. And that's because these spinner variables, lambda and lambda tilde, rephase under the rotations generated by the helicity operator. So that's great. It's very convenient for writing um, amplitudes that transform under helicity. Not so great for writing down amplitudes that transform non-trivially under the translations for generic massless representations with rho non-zero, because lambda and lambda tilde are actually annihilated by the translation generator. So in order to describe little group transformations of generic massless particles with rho not equal to zero, you actually need to add more data to your kinematic, more kinematic data for massless particles than just lambda and lambda tilde. Um, and trying to write things in standard massless spinner helicity is actually the enforcer of this rho equals zero assumption. Um, so we'll need, to, we'll need to generalize it a bit in order to write down continuous spin amplitudes. So, I presented this in a vacuum, and you might ask, OK, all of these little group arguments, they, they were developed very nicely by Wigner in 1939. It's been almost a century. Why are we not, like, why are these not part of standard canons? Surely there's something terribly wrong with them. And there may be something terribly wrong with them. We're still looking for that. Um, but this, the, the sort of simplest and slickest counter arguments that people have used all actually fail when you look at them very closely. Um, so the first thing that I hoped to do, actually, when I started studying this a little over a decade ago, is, well, there's all these reasons that amplitudes for massless high spin particles are sick. So surely continuous spin has high spin. It must be sick, too. But all those sickness arguments are really actually deeply relying on the boost invariance of the helicity state. So they don't transfer over to non-zero rho. And in fact, in the case of Weinberg soft factors, we found generalizations back then for uh, rho non-zero. There were also claims that it's incompatible with field theory. These attempts didn't allow for any gauge redundancy. They would have failed just for trying to write down a field theory of the photon, which is obviously consistent with field theory. And we can address it in the same way by adding a gauge redundancy to the description. So we found one such theory in 2014. This has since been generalized to fermions. It's been generalized to supersymmetric theories, higher dimensions, et cetera. There's no incompatibility with field theory. And then the last argument is a more physical one that was given in at least one lecture by Wigner that, well, since they have infinitely many states, that's going to lead to problems with thermodynamics, which Wigner emphasized, and per perhaps also divergent cross sections. But what you actually find when you look at the interactions constrained by Lorentz symmetry, what Lorentz inv invariance lets you write down for these continuous spin interactions is a calculable result that's actually well behaved for things like cross sections and thermodynamics. And the reason for that is a peculiar structure of the interactions for theories with non-zero rho, which I think is very, was very surprising when we first encountered it, but actually makes a lot of sense if you just think about the kinematics that I told you, that if the rho goes to zero limit, you just get a tower of familiar helicity states. 
And that is that the energy, that the interactions and energy is much larger than rho are the only thing they can be to be consistent with that rho goes to zero limit. Either the helicity zero, helicity one, or helicity two modes have interactions that look just like what's allowed for ordinary scalar helicity zero, one, or two particles. And other helicities interactions are suppressed by increasingly large powers of rho over E so that they can shut off in this rho goes to zero limit. So that's a structure that we first found in the soft, amplitude, soft emission amplitudes that we found a decade ago, um, but have been able to look at much more broadly through the current coupling framework we developed last year, uh, which continues to support that picture. And so this leads to a much more satisfying answer, at least for the physicists. I'm not sure this one works on the young children. Um, much more satisfying answer to why theories with Lorentz invariant helicities seem to work so well to describe nature. Maybe it's not a God-given truth, and maybe it's not an abuse of authority by our elders. Maybe it's because of Taylor's theorem, because deviations from this Lorentz invariant helicity picture are controlled by a parameter, the ratio of rho to energy, that happens to be small in the everyday world. So maybe invariant helicities work for the same reason that non-relativistic mechanics works or classical mechanics works. It's all about a small parameter and a limit that you recover in that regime. So that said, there's a lot of reasons to explore non-zero rho and see how much we, progress we can make understanding these theories. First of all, because they come out of basic postulates of relativity and quantum mechanics, I think as a theorist, you have to look at that and say, okay, let's understand the most general possibilities because they're there. Um, as a phenomenologist, it's more, even more interesting because they might really be there. So we can actually think about experimentally looking for signs that the photon or the graviton might have non-zero but very small rho. Um, we can think about applying it even more generally in the standard model because after all, every particle that we know of is either fundamentally massless before electric symmetry breaking or unnaturally light. And so thinking about applications to all kinds of standard model problems of non-zero row could be fruitful. OK, so I've given you the basic kinematic story that invariant, Lorentz invariant helicity is actually a really special case. And in general, the helicities of massless particles mix under Lorentz, controlled by a new scale, the spin scale rho. I want to now tell you a little bit more quantitatively about the work that we've done on coupling CSPs to matter. Um, first by introducing our gauge theory and then some of the results on coupling matter to that gauge theory. After that, I'll try to save time for a brief invitation to CSP scattering amplitudes. Um, okay, so this is the amplitudes conference. It's not a great place to talk about off-shell Lagrangians and their gauge redundancies. Um, so I'll keep this brief uh, just to give you some intuition. Uh, CSP as rho goes to zero needs to contain all the integer helicity modes, which we usually describe at a helicity h by a rank h symmetric tensor field. And so it's natural to try to group all of those tensor fields together as Taylor coefficients of some big field that depends not just on a position x, but on some other four vector. And then the Taylor coefficient at rank one is a, is a rank one gauge field, at second order is a rank two symmetric gauge field, et cetera. And Lorentz transformations act simply on this master field. Um, the kind of action on such a field that actually gives you one propagating CSP degree of freedom is pretty simple. This is it. So it's localized to a hyperboloid in this eta, auxiliary eta variable. Um, there's both a standard kinetic term, and then this delta operator mixes space time and eta space derivatives. So it's kind of like interior derivatives on the component, component fields. Uh, you have to regulate the eta space integral because it has a naive, naively divergent volume, um, but that can be done by analytic continuation. And then if you wanted to work with tensor fields, you could. You can decompose this field psi, start as I did in my initial motivation, into rank H tensor fields. And at each rank, you just get, and the Lagrangian decomposes into a direct sum of familiar actions for the low ranks and Fransdell actions for the high ranks. Um, at row non-zero, you're just adding a bunch of mixing terms to the Lagrangian. It's not very insightful. Even helicity eigenmodes have contributions at an infinite number of different tensor ranks uh, once you turn on non-zero row. I think a better physical picture is to try to fix the gauge as much as possible and just ask, where is the physical information in this field? So I can fix a gauge to this delta operator annihilating my field. Then the equation of motion is proportional to box psi equals zero. 
And the solution are functions of eta with null momentum and uh, arbitrary dependence on just the transverse pieces of eta, eta dot k and eta dotted into some transverse polarization vectors. The dependence on the components of eta that are not, the component of eta that's not orthogonal to, to k is totally fixed by this gauge condition. Now, there's two other simplifications of this still very, very unconstrained function. One is that only the unit norm eta content of this function is going to be dynamical. And second, the eta dot k dependence turns out to be pure gauge on shell. And so between those two, you reduce this information first to a kind of cylinder, a function on a cylinder in eta space, and then removing the pure gauge piece, the physical content is characterized by a function on a unit circle in eta space transverse to k. And this circle has a really nice picture in terms of the little group. Um, and so to understand that, I want to introduce one more basis for the states that I introduced at the beginning. So I started by diagonalizing helicity. That's a nice thing to do for physics. Um, but another natural thing to do, um, and actually what Wigner originally did, is to instead diagonalize the two translation generators, W1 and 2. They commute, so they can be simultaneously diagonalized. That is, if I thought about this ISO2 as isometries of some two-dimensional Euclidean space-time, those are the momentum operators. right? So this is like working in momentum space of the little group. Um, the invariant W squared tells us that the eigenvalues W1 and little w1 and little w2 have to lie on some unit, some circle of radius rho in that little group space. So I can characterize any point on that circle by an angle phi. And any arbitrary state is specified by a function of phi. That function of phi, that function on the circle, when I scale out, rho is exactly the function on the unit eta circle that we encountered on the last slide. Um, and just in general, it's useful to keep these two bases in mind because the physics, especially the high energy physics, is simplest in the helicity basis. But math and transformation properties of states tend to be simpler in this angle basis. And you can go between the two of them just by, just by a Fourier transform of the basis states. OK, so our field theory at a free level exists. That's great, but it's also not that interesting. Lots of theories that don't admit consistent interactions can be written as free field theories. Um, what this is really useful for is that it gives us a framework to start looking for conserved matter currents and define what condition those matter currents have to satisfy. And this is where, frankly, where we got stuck a decade ago, is trying to find such a current. Once you find it, there's a powerful crank to turn the equation of motion in a sensible gauge is just box psi equals j. There's really nothing new going on here once you've found that current, gone to that gauge, and you can use totally standard machinery to do physics. But the hard part is finding the current that satisfies this condition. Um, and the, the thing that really let us make progress on this was that we stopped trying last year to do this out of fields. And we instead tried to build such a current out of a matter particle world line. And there's a huge technical simplification from that, which is just that you have less data in a world line than in two external legs. Um, there may be some deeper reasons, too. Um, so we assumed the current is some local function of the world line data. So it's going to be an integral over a world line parameter tau of some function that is translation invariant, um, but knows where the world line is relative to where you are, and also can depend on the velocity of the world line at that particular parameter tau and on this auxiliary variable eta. And you can just find the most general solution to the continuity to this conservation condition that I had on the last slide for functions of this form. And the most general solution can be written in momentum space in terms of two pieces. So the second piece I'm going to ignore for now um, it's proportional to the equation of motion operator acting on some completely arbitrary function. You can generate lots of fancy looking currents this way and think, ooh, I've coupled something to CSPs. But they're all proportional to the equation of motion operator, which means they can't source anything, any long distance radiation. This is analogous to things like the charge radius operator for E and M. Um, if you put in functions x that have extent off of the matter world line, then it's going to affect long-range CSP exchange forces, because you're really changing 
the, the physical shape of your current, the extent of your current. Um, it ex affects the space-time support of the current, but it doesn't affect any on-shell radiation. So if we're looking at on-shell CSP production, you can forget about that and just look at this particular solution with a phase structure and then some function g hat that only depends on the radiated momentum k and z dot of the particle. And this choice of g hat fully determines the interactions of the world line with on-shell CSP radiation. So you can just look at its Taylor component. Um, so the, the leading piece gives you a scalar-like interaction. If that's zero and the leading piece is instead linear in the, for, in the world line velocity, that turns out to give you a vector-like interaction. And at higher powers, you can either get sort of non-minimally coupled uh, scalar interactions, or if all world lines in your theory couple equally, it actually looks, or you have only one world line. At least for that world line sector, it looks graviton-like. Oh, I'm sorry. Z is the position of the world line in space-time, and Z dot is the four velocity. Thank you. Um, okay. So you might have been a little bit surprised that I said this one over rho thing is the thing that looks like a, like a holicity one interaction in space-time. Um, but when you, when you combine that with the phase structure, you actually see that the order one over rho piece is a total derivative. So it doesn't contribute anything physical when you integrate over the world line. And the leading piece that's left is just the sort of eta space rewriting of the usual vector current plus higher order terms in row. And so at a formal level, it makes sense based on that, that this kind of interaction should look approximately like a vector in a row expansion. And indeed, that's what you see. If you look, for example, at a simple source, which is just a particle oscillating at some frequency omega, um, with some characteristic oscillation velocity v naught, um, and at the origin in space time, and you look at the total power radiated by this by this particle, at high energies, high oscillation frequencies relative to rho, you just get the standard Larmor power plus a series of corrections at higher orders in rho over omega. Um, so here you can see this uv limiting behavior on the left of the plot. This is a rho over omega type variable, so the UV is on the left, IR is on the right, and I've plotted on the y-axis the power normalized to Larmor power at that frequency. So you start out matching the Larmor formula exactly with all of the power going into the helicity plus and minus one modes illustrated by this blue curve. And then as you go to lower and lower frequencies, the total power gets contributions from all the other helicities. But the total power actually drops. And in fact, it drops to exactly half of the Larmor power, very generally in this case. Uh, so the total power emitted has a finite limit, even though you're sourcing a larger number of modes. You can also use world line path integral techniques to calculate things like a Compton-like amplitude. Um, the procedure is very much like uh, world line path integral for QED amplitudes. You just have these new eta-dependent vertex operators. And it's easy to get amplitudes out of that, which are pretty simple in the angle basis. Um, Fourier transform to get a helicity basis result. And I mean, there's a lot of things one could say about this odds loss amplitude. Um, but I think some of the important features, it has no one physical singularities. It looks sensible at all the physical singularities. And the kinematics differential cross sections you get out of it are finite at all energies. The, you can also look at its rho goes to zero limit. Notice the one over rho terms have disappeared in the amplitude as promised because that was supposed to be an unphysical total derivative um, coupling. So if you take the rho goes to zero limit, that's just like ignoring this phase. And it, this turns out to be, if you just thought of eta's, replace the eta's with external polarizations, this is just a Feynman parametrization of the standard scalar QED result that makes, for example, permutation symmetry and gauge invariance manifest, but totally obscures locality. Um, so, so this gives you just a rewriting of the QED amplitude for small rho over energy with rho dependent corrections, which as you expand, give you the high energy leading behavior for other helicities. And there's a similar structure in the resulting cross section formulas um, to what we saw in larva radiation. So the cross section in the UV looks very much like what you have in QED um, and is dominated by the standard helicity modes. 
And then other helicity modes start kicking in as you go into the IR. But again, the cross-section remains finite, whether you're looking at Compton or a crossed process like pair production. OK, so I want with that as motivation, I want to start now talking about how do we think more generally about CSP amplitudes. Um, I, something I mentioned implicitly earlier is that the, OK, I'm all out. Shoot, I didn't see your earlier warnings. Um, OK, I'll try to give the one minute version. Is that OK? OK, one minute version of these last few slides. Happy to talk about more later. Um, so to do a spinner helicity for CSPs, you need to keep track of an auxiliary variable. This can be an auxiliary spinner instead of an auxiliary vector to give you something more like spinner helicity. Um, but where the covariance of the amplitudes actually requires a non-trivial dependence on mu because there's some inhomogeneous equations that have to be satisfied. You can try to build three-point amplitudes, and you find that you don't have enough kinematic data to, to satisfy all of those conditions. Um, but this seems like a problem with a limitation of the method rather than a problem with CSPs. And in particular, if you ask what's going on in a factorization limit of a higher point amplitude, you see that there's this wildly oscillating phase, which at real momentum in a, in a singular limit is actually just damping the amplitude. So that's good. We want our amplitudes to go to zero in factorization in real momentum limits, um, but in the, or at least remain finite. But when you go to complex momenta, that oscillating phase starts looking like a generic essential singularity. And there's some directions where it grows exponentially fast. Um, so that's what's obstructing three-point amplitudes. Um, but if, if you're going to complexify momentum, you might as well complexify the little group as well. And when you do that, it looks like you can get around this problem and actually build three-point amplitudes for these sort of half CSPs that transform CSP-like on, say, the right left-handed spinners um, or the, sorry, this is CSP-like in the right-handed spinners, um, but helicity-like in the left-handed spinners. And these emit three-point amplitudes that you can, you can build higher point factorizing amplitudes out of. Um, so there's a lot of questions remaining about CSPs. Um, many of them, I think, are uh, begging for an amplitudes approach. Um, in particular, these questions about intermediate CSPs and off-shelf physics, it would be great to get access to that without having to address all of these ambiguities that showed up in the Lagrangian context, um, maybe gain some clarity about that, um, as well as thinking about questions of self-interactions and gravitational couplings, which are probably much more tractable in an amplitudes context. Um, we don't know whether massless particles in nature have a zero spin scale or not. The non-zero option makes more sense than previously thought. And if it's inconsistent, it deserves a proper burial. If it's viable, then it tells us that actually we should be thinking of the standard model as an effective theory that not only has a UV completion, but also an IR completion where the new physics of these partner modes starts to become relevant. And there's a lot of interesting questions that remain to really understand that IR physics. Thanks for a nice talk. Um, so if I understood correctly, you, you showed us how your um, continuous spin particle couples in a word line description to the electromagnetic field, right? This was, um, so I this was, was showing, I was treating the continuous spin degrees of freedom as a field and matter as a world line. So, so the, the matter Z, sorry, the, the Z that I was talking about, the world line parameter was the position of the matter particle. Oh, I see. Okay, good. Uh, Any more questions? Yeah, sorry. So in the beginning, uh, when you explained these other these CSPs from the Pauli Lubansky vector, it seemed that it was important that you were in four dimensions. Do these do they generalize to higher dimensions in any way? Yeah, they do. Um, so the the treatment I gave was four dimensional. The representation structure gets a little bit more complicated as you go to higher dimensions. There are more invariants, but there are generalizations of this non-zero row. Um, to higher dimensions as well. Yes. I, I just gave yeah, the, yeah. Oh, uh, so as a takeaway, many questions remain to understand in the IR. So just as how do we think about 
the CSPs as pointing us in the IR direction. I'm sure it's, it's just contained in what you said, but what's what's the thing to think about? Um, essentially, everything looks like ordinary. So the 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 way to the, there's a dimension full parameter rho, the spin scale. It has units of momentum. So the dimensionless quantity is rho over energy. That gets small in the UV. And so things start looking familiar in the UV. And that's essentially, if, if any theory that has a UV limit, rho over energy is getting small in the UV. So that's like a rho equals zero theory. As you go into the IR, rho over E gets big and the deviations can become larger. And as I showed in these example calculations, things seem to stay healthy, at least the calculations we've been able to make to, to do, stay healthy in the IR. You, even, you still get finite cross-sections, but they start looking much more exotic, where you have many more modes being produced. OK. Any so yes. right. Please. Oh, sorry. I want to force you to make the speculation in public. Uh, <laughs> uh, so um, might the Higgs be a CSP? Uh, and uh, so in the IR, we see that it secretly has all these higher spins, and that's why it's light. Um, yeah, so I think that is a, uh, so I, we're, we're right now trying to understand what happens to our field theory when you give the CSP a mass, um, or how, how, how can you give a mass, what happens to it. Um, but there is a really intriguing observation that I think Nima, Nima is alluding to, which is that the scalar-like CSP interaction, I talked mostly about the one that looks like a photon in the UV, but there's a counterpart that looks just like a scalar. Um, it looks like a scalar with Yukawa coupling. And yet it seems like whatever the massive phase is, there must be a degree of freedom discontinuity between the, the case that it's massless and you have this one representation with every spin. And then as it gets massive, somehow, you know, the helicity one mode and minus one modes need to group into a new spin one massive particle. Helicity two and minus two need to get grouped into a spin two massive particle. And so there's gonna be a degree of freedom discontinuity as you add these additional modes to the theory. It looks like there could there's some degree of freedom protection for the massless state, massless limit relative to the massive one. And there's also some early hints we've seen in the two-point function of scalar CSPs that the pole is protected by in these interactions. And somehow you don't get radiative corrections to the pole mass the way you would for an ordinary Yukawa theory. And so those two ingredients together suggest that maybe a light of, if a massive, in every other example we know of, if the exactly massless symmetry can be prote is protected by an exact symmetry, there is a counterpart where a low mass is protected by an approximate symmetry. And I think we're, we're far from having, having an understanding of that, but it's very plausible that that could be. And then, you know, what happens? So the Higgs is a CSP. It has to have partners somewhere. Those partners should be very weakly coupled um, by rho over energy. And, and maybe that's something we could look for that also has interesting sort of IR deformation with interesting phenomenological consequences for how we understand the standard model. If you wanted to bound rho, what experimental data would you look at first? Good. Um, so what I would love to do, because they're very precise, is long-range force tests. But as I mentioned, there are some ambiguities in exactly what long-range force modifications you get from CSPs. And for some of the example currents that we looked at, at least the static force law is exactly 1 over, one over R with no deviations. Um, but then the deviations start at uh, higher order in velocity. Um, so the most robust constraint is going to be from radiation phenomena. And one thing that, of, of everything we've looked at so far, so you can look at, for example, ultra long wavelength for the photon. Ultra long wavelength radio transmission is a decent place to start. Most of it's classified because ultra long wavelength radio is used for like communicating with nuclear subs. Um, but the fact that it works without order one deviations gives you some bound that rho is at the like inverse kilometer level or so. Um, you can actually look further than that. So these partner modes of the photon could be produced in the core of the sun. And that takes you down to rho of about a nano electron volt. That I think is better than any cosmological production bound and better than direct radiation bounds that we have right now. 
that runs into all of these velocity dependence off shell. How do we how do we compute it? Kinds of problems. Um, so there there may be, but it depends on the details of your theory, and one can one can always consider that there might be versions of the CSP current that don't run into that problem. Just because you compute it for one doesn't mean it's there for all of them. Um, so yeah, you can also think about, I think one of the next places to look would be if we are producing these in the core of the sun, maybe we're not producing enough to wipe out the sun faster than, than in standard cosmology, but we are producing enough that you could detect them with some, some instruments. So that's one thing to look at. Forbidden transitions could be another. Anything where you have a chance of enhancing these row over energy effects to make them more observable. All right. Yes, just one more, and then <laughs> we call it. Uh, thank you for an interesting talk. Um, since you talked about the field theory description of uh, continuous spin, do you expect to find uh, soliton solutions um, that might be relevant for monopole production, for example? At the level of, this is a completely free theory, and so you don't, I don't expect to see any soliton-like dynamics in this. Certainly, I think understanding if, you have, if there are non-abelian generalizations, for example, what kinds of soliton solutions they have and how that might be different from standard non-abelian theories is extraordinarily interesting. But at this completely free level, I don't think you can get that. It's just plain waves. All right. Uh, well, I guess we can thank Natalia for this uh, wonderful talk.